Thank you for finding us again. No stoplights. I want to thank our sponsor, sole sponsor for a singularly dedicated podcast. Um, full disclosure, I'm a Gamecock fan. Have been all my life um, a loyal Gamecock fan. And when I went to Rick Havacost at Mickey Finn's, I said, hey, man, we share two things. And you sell booze and I drink booze. And we both love the Gamecocks. So Havacost started supplying me with um, Jefferson's Ocean. It is a select and exquisite uh, bourbon. I tell people if you drink enough, I don't drink too much because I'm Baptist. But for those that drink too much, I've heard it makes you recite the Declaration of Independence one time after another after another. But but I, I want to make sure that Rick uh, knows how much we appreciate his support of, uh, of Gamecock Athletics, Garnet Trust. Doesn't mean he doesn't love the Tigers. He's in the um, he's in the the, the commerce business. And, um, and obviously, Gamecocks, Tigers, Shauna Clears, Patriots, uh, Terriers, Bulldogs, they all um, have their share of libation. So um, if you need any sort of libation uh, or party uh, party favor, go to Mickey Finn's and tell the folks at Mickey Finn's that we hear it um, at No Stoplight sent you. So, so I want to introduce our next guest, and I want to be careful to – um, this guest and I met about an hour ago, uh, maybe 45 minutes ago. Taylor Edwards is director of player personnel at the university of South Carolina. He has a very official capacity. He doesn't have the luxury nor the, uh, the liberties that I have as a non-official at the university. I have a lot of opinions. Once again, I think, I think being a loyal fan entitled me to raise more hell than I probably should when things aren't going well, they are going real well in basketball right now. But we're here talking about football. And on the radio show and on this podcast, we've, uh, over the years, talked about, over the past year, talked about NIL, what's right, what's wrong, what works, what doesn't work. How do we get to a to a better place, a more favorable place for the player, the university, the fan? Uh, and I think we're in the mix of trying to figure that out together. But, but I, I talk about it. I talk a lot about NIL. I talk a lot about college athletics. Taylor Edwards, director of player personnel, at the university, lives it. It's his job. It's his occupation. He has no choice but to kind of um, eat, breathe, and sleep it. So, Taylor, uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Ken. I, uh, I had I known an hour ago when we met that you were getting a bottle of bourbon for this, I, I we would have I would have probably restructured my deal and commitment on the way down here. I, I'll get you a bottle of bourbon on this. <laughs> okay. well, you know, <laughs> no, it's not enough. previously negotiated, but I'll make sure <laughs> that our good friend at, uh, at Mickey Finns takes care of you. I want I want to start with a little bit about you and who you are and what you're about. I mean, we'll, we'll get into what you do for the university and how important uh, it is what you do. But but who is Taylor Edwards? Where does he come from? How does he end up at the University of South Carolina. I appreciate you asking. Uh, born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. I uh, went to uh, high school at Pleasant Grove High School, which is about 15 minutes west of downtown. So if you're looking at a map, I always tell people, you start driving from downtown Birmingham to Tuscaloosa, you're going to see my exit on the way down. So uh, born and raised there. I um, actually played all three high school sports, basketball, baseball, and football. Um, wished I would have been blessed uh, physically with a little different body type, if you will, to play football at the next level, but was, was not. I uh, went to the University of Montevallo, uh, played baseball there. I was a pitcher, always developed and, and, and always had my love for, for college football, followed it very closely, um, and uh, just always kind of knew I wanted to do something in this field. I just didn't know what at the time. So fast forward, get my, my, uh, my diploma, graduate and uh, I got a job as a graduate assistant at the uh, at Troy University. Uh, and that's when I started, I really got into athletics. I started working, I was more on the admin side, working with the athletics director, the people that were doing the annual giving, all that stuff. And um, I always knew I wanted to be on the other side of the buildings in, in some way, somehow. And uh, long story short, got connected with some of those guys and started kind of making a transition to a degree. And once I finished up with my, uh, my, my graduate school, um, actually, our old tight ends coach, uh, Jody Wright. Um, I ran into one of his high school friends that I had played college baseball for, and he uh, he connected us. Jody was leaving Alabama at the time as an analyst to go be the tight ends coach at Jacksonville State, the other Gamecocks. And um, Jody got me on up there as a, I was more or less an intern. And uh, that's where it all really started for me. I worked in recruiting and operations at Jacksonville State for roughly a year. Bill Clark at the time was the head coach at Jacksonville State. He got the head job at UAB after that season. So we all picked up and moved to UAB, and that was when I really got my first official title and paycheck, and I was full-time, so to speak. Um, 
I was there for the the one and only season that we had because they shut the program down. Sure if you did. remember that, so we uh, we beat Southern Miss week twelve to go so, uh, six and six. And uh, the next week, they had a board of trustees meeting and said we didn't have a program anymore. So that was a very unique situation. So I, I jokingly say all the time, I went from hired to fired very quickly. And um, so from there, Jody actually left uh, UAB. Uh, he was the running backs coach, assistant head coach there. He left UAB and moved and went back to Tuscaloosa to be the director of player personnel. And I'm like, I knew that's what I always wanted to do. So what better way to learn how to do it other than a guy that had given you your first job and I looked at as a mentor and a friend and somebody I thought very highly of. And then what better place to do it than the University of Alabama? Obviously, Coach Saban was there. And, um, you know, they, they had a lot of people that helped build that thing to what it was before he retired here recently. And I got a chance to go get a firsthand experience and see for myself kind of where this whole player personnel, this whole front office, this whole thing, wh where it all started, essentially. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, Coach Saban got the job at Alabama. Uh, he left the Dolphins, and, you know, the rest was kind of history. But he he really was the one. He was the head coach that started all of this personnel stuff. And um, so I got a firsthand experience down there, uh, was very blessed. And then um, from there, I, I had another stint at UAB. I had a stint at Stanford. Uh, not to bore you with all the stops that I've made because I've worked at every school in the state of Alabama, I feel like. But um, I ended up uh, leaving the state finally and got a job at, at Arkansas under Chad Morris. I was there for a year. Uh, it was not a great year. We, we had a terrible year on the field. And then because of my time at Alabama, you hear all the time in this industry how, oh, this guy worked for Coach Saban or this guy was at Alabama. Like, it's crazy the number of people that have come in and out of that facility and gotten jobs, whether it be coordinator jobs or head coaching jobs. Well, I was very fortunate from, from that being the case because Mike Loxley left Alabama and got the head job at Maryland, and he hired me there as his director of recruiting. So I went to, went to Maryland. I was there for two seasons. And then um, I always tell people all the time, thank God Coach Beamer called me. So um, it Had was – Had you known Shane at all? You Before know, he reaches I, out to you. Funny story. Yes, um, I when I was unpacking um, from getting this job, I found a letter that he had written me when he was at Virginia Tech, um, and the way that we knew each other was my mentor friend Jody Wright. They knew each other. They had worked together when uh, Coach Beamer was at Mississippi State and under Coach Croom. So they worked together there. They'd always kept in touch. Obviously, Shane was kind of doing his own thing, and he was navigating his way to becoming a head coach at South Carolina, but he was navigating his way around, and we were doing our thing and navigating our way around. But Jody and, and Shane actually – Coach Beamer, I should say. Yeah, sorry. Um, they, um, they actually kept in touch a lot more than, than Coach Beamer and I did. But um, all that to say, yes, we had a, a, a vague, very vague uh, you know, relationship. We didn't really know each other. We never worked with each other. But Jody was always kind of that conduit between us. And, um, you know, I would always write him a letter wishing him a luck before the season. He would write me a letter. You know, we stayed in touch that way. We'd run into each other at the coaches' convention every season after, after the year was over with. Um, so that was always kind of how we, how we talked. In fact, I shot him a text um, when he got the job. And it was like, hey, you know, congratulations. You know, you deserve it. Good luck at South Carolina kind of thing. And one of my good friends was – in this role prior under Muschamp, and I think it was, you know, I don't know what, what direction things were going, but he shot me a text back, said thank you, and then it felt like what, maybe a week later, he's, he's, he's shooting me another text saying, hey, like, you know, you got time to talk, and that's kind of when things started, un, you know, developing for me to end up here, thank goodness. So, and, and you knew what about Gamecock football? I mean, what did you know? I knew. I mean, obviously at Arkansas and Alabama, there's this conference absolutely uh, familiarity we have with one another. But what did you know? I mean, we we have once again, we're loyal fans. We're irrational. We're impractical. We 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 expect that of ourselves. But what did you know from afar about uh, about Gamecock so, football? The only time I had ever been to Columbia, South Carolina, and this will probably summarize what I know about or knew about South Carolina football at this point in time. The only thing, the only time I'd ever been here was the 2010 season when the Gamecocks beat Alabama, but I'm not going to lie to you. I was in the upper deck as an Alabama fan. That was the only thing I knew. So I guess you could say I knew how hot as hell it was in Columbia, South Carolina, especially in what September, I think that game yeah. was. It was early part of the year. So I knew how hot it was. 
And I knew how rowdy the fans were because I got smoked by a beer bottle leaving the stadium that night because I was probably running my mouth a little too much. But anyway, I knew. Uh, and then obviously, I mean, I, 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 I grew up in a state that, you know, everybody loved football. I mean, Alabama, Auburn, like somebody, you had to pick a side. There was no middle ground. You know, you had to pick a team. You had to be a fan. So I knew how passionate of a fan base it was um, because of that. I mean, you know, in the – you. I grew up in an SEC state, so my goal was to always work in the Southeastern Conference, and being able to get that opportunity was a blessing. So when Coach Beamer makes the call, makes the inquiry, do you think long and hard about it? Is it an instantaneous decision? Yes, this is absolutely the uh, the, the best next move in my in my career. No, it was a coach. Yes, I'm in. I mean, it was it was the easiest yes that I've ever had to give anybody. I mean, there was really no thinking on it. There was no, let me go talk to this person or that person. I mean, I, I, it was a matter of me calling my parents to let them know I was getting a little closer home. <laughs> Honestly, I, I there was no reservation. There was uh, no hesitation. It was I was all I, I was ready to go. I just needed to know when I needed to be in Columbia. So so you take the job. You become a part of the Gamecock staff, not on the field coaching, but rather director of player personnel in an era of college football that is probably as changing by the moment as it ever has been. Um, there's a big debate, and I want to get into conceptual here. There's a big debate in college football now about where do we go from here. I don't know many true college football fans, Taylor, that blame the coach, blame the university, blame the player, blame the fan. They don't like where we are. They don't like where we're headed. But they, they really and truly don't have a boogeyman. There's, in politics, there's always a boogeyman. It's their fault. No, it's, it's their fault. Do, do any, does, does anybody have clarity on where we go from here? Because I want to get to the concept. But your job is to evaluate players make recommendation to coaches, hold recruiters accountable. I don't want to – I'd rather you explain exactly what a director player personnel does for Gamecock football. Okay. Um, you know, and it's funny you you started out uh, by saying that it's it's such a unique time in college football because it would – if I really went back and just unloaded every – like it's totally different today than when I took this job. I mean, if you think about it, think about how much things have changed in just four years – I mean, it, it, it really is a, a complete 180 from even the day we walked in the door. I mean, our first year, I don't, I don't believe that we even – we didn't do an NIL. There was no – there really was – it wasn't until year two when you started hearing about these NIL deals that were starting to get done around the country. And then it's year three. It's like, all right, we've we got to go. You know what I mean? And now you're in full you're, – you know, you're in year four, and it's like – and this is just part of the process now, man. I mean, so that's kind of where it's come, even while I've been here, much less 10 years ago, 11 years ago when I got started in college football. So, um, let, you know, that it's, it's, it, is, it has become very unique. And I would say that my job has changed a good bit because of that. Um, not to bore people, but my job initially, don't think NIL related, it is to identify and evaluate prospects. OK, grade film, determine who's good enough, who's not good enough, why they're good enough, why they're not good enough, and who's kind of in that middle ground of guys that could potentially become good enough, right, to win games with. Is that something you're instinctively born with or do you get better at it? I, I think I think you I think I'm not going to sit up here and act like I'm some prodigy, but I think, you know, people have the ability. Right. But I think you can always it's kind of like you got a knife but you can always make the knife blade sharper, right? So you can always learn more. You can always see different ways of doing things. You hear different ways of doing things. And I think you can always hone your skills because I, I, I do. I feel it. Like if I go a period of time without watching tape and I get back in front of the computer and I start watching tape, like, you know, I have to refresh my memory a little bit on some things. I have to kind of look at things differently. So, yeah, I mean, I do think there, there's probably some ability there. Um, my mentor, Jody Wright, I mean, he, he's – in my opinion, was one of the best evaluators that I've ever been around. I mean, a position coach, on the field, off the field, it doesn't matter. Like, that was one thing that I thought he did an exceptional job of, and I would always try to pick his brain on it. And he was, it was going back to the whole, like, are you born with it? I, he would always – I always felt like he would struggle to articulate what what it is he saw or, or, or what it was. So I do think that there's some ability there. There's some natural ability, but I do think also that you can develop a skill for it. I think. So, so Taylor, when you're, when you're evaluating 
and and you find this kid, and and something about this kid convinces you he can play in the SEC. You're not, I mean, you're not solely responsible for that decision. Who do you go to? Who do you bounce it off of? Do you show that film to Coach Beamer, position coach? I mean, so we w- have, walk us through that process. We have a process. So kid gets identified. I've got a great group of young guys that I call, they're our recruiting specialists. They help me kind of create that filter of prospects. Then we put it, we, we, we always watch from an area coach perspective and a position coach perspective. So each coach has an area of South Carolina. They're in charge of this county or that county, so to speak, right? So we watch from an area coach perspective and a position coach perspective. And those prospects just continuously get passed on. So if it's the area coach and it's not the position coach, he'll pass it to the position coach. Position coach would then watch it as a position coach and say, yeah, I really like this guy. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I think we can fix through the developmental process. And then that gets passed to our offense and defensive coordinators. And then they watch as a group. And they kind of thumbs up, thumbs down, say, yeah, I think this is a guy that's for us or a guy that's not, and here's why, right? And then once it gets to that point, I usually kind of cross-check it and make sure we're all on the same page, and then I get it in front of Coach Beamer. Our process is we don't allow coaches to just go rogue and do what they want to do as coaches. They have to follow the procedure, and Coach Beamer is ultimately the one that d- dictates who we're offering scholarships So to. when you make a determination that this kid is somebody worth your attention, you want to go recruit and try to convince him to be a Gamecock, we hear these stories about these war rooms yeah. and these recruiting battles. He's the number one linebacker on South Carolina's board. Right. He's the number two cornerback on South Carolina's board. I mean, there's positions of need, and then there's kids you take it at matter. I mean, well, when I was younger, Herschel Walker what would have been that example. I don't care how many running backs Georgia had. They're taking that cat uh, because he's that good. But but how does in the evaluation process, how does someone end up the third linebacker on the board? And the first line back on the board. What what process do you go through it's, to get there? Once you know, I mean, that's a great question because all three technically have a scholarship offer to South Carolina, right? But you you always try to prioritize and you say, all right, I think this guy's better. He may be bigger. He may be faster. He may be stronger. He may, you know, better tape. I mean, there's just there's a variety of reasons that we think that he's better. So you just naturally create that pecking order with all of your top prospects that you've offered, and it's it, and again it it. it that takes shape because of a variety of different reasons and, and as to why one is in front of the other. But, you know, and it, it may be because he's an in-state kid. I mean, you always prioritize the guy. We call it our footprint. North Carolina or South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia. That's kind of what our footprint is. I mean, we've, we've gone a little more north than maybe South Carolina's done in the past, but we were trying to create a niche because we could sell that SEC logo. Not to get on a whole other topic of conversation there, but – that's it. We we create it. We create that pecking order based off of a variety of different things. Is where I'm going with this. And then once that pecking order is is taken shape, then that's when you kind of know how to approach each kid. How 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 hard you want to go after him. Does that make sense? Sure. So that's where all that kind of stems from. Okay. When you were in Maryland, I mean, I would imagine. Well, without I don't want to be disrespectful to Maryland, but you're not button heads with Tennessee and Clemson and Georgia and Alabama and Florida and Florida State. You are now. How aware are you of the relationship the other schools have with the kid you're recruiting? How important is that for you to know, okay, they like us, but they like Alabama too. They like Georgia too. They like Tennessee, Clemson as well. How how do you, I don't know, update where we stand in regards to the other institutions? No, I mean, you see, I know a lot of people read different, uh, I don't don't want to promote another business here, but 247 Sports or, you know, Gamecock Central, I mean, that's what all those guys help us do too. Like we we're constantly scouring the internet, reading articles. I mean, that's what my team does. I mean, we we try to develop that. We try to cr- uh, track down that intel on each kid. Like, hey, this is what he said about Tennessee. This is what he said about us. And you know, I mean, these kids are no different than anybody else. I mean, if you ask ten people something, that you're going to get ten different answers. But you're also going to get some information from each person that's probably you know valuable, right? So just Talking to the people that are in his circle, but also talking to him, and then I think you got to do you got to do research. You got to always be on the computer. You got to always be in front of the phone, looking, seeing what other people are saying. Because a lot of times the kid will tell you a lot about what he's thinking or feeling about another school without even saying anything. Is that kind of a psychological science? I think there's a little bit to kids, it. Kids, I would imagine, don't like saying no. Exactly. I mean, they want to tell you, yeah. They want to tell Clemson, yeah. Georgia, Tennessee, yeah. Well, is kids, there some psychological 
I experiment think, going on. And you're exactly right because kids will, you know, it's a, it's it's hard for a kid to just commit and be done with it because they they get addicted to the love. They're you kids. Know what I mean? Exactly. And I, I can't say that I'd be any different. You know what I mean? I mean, if, and I probably shouldn't admit this with South Carolina on my chest, but if some of these other schools wanted me to come hang out for a weekend, it'd be pretty cool. So I'd probably want to do it too, right? I mean, that's, we're all human. That, that's just kind of how it is. So I don't get all been out of shape if, if stuff like that. Now, I think once you make that commitment, then, you know, you got to be a man about it and you got to kind of tell people no, okay? Um, but I also don't think that there's anything wrong with the recruiting process, I guess, is where I'm going with that. But what, what, what do we offer the kid? In other words, I'm, we'll get to NIL in a second. But I mean, what, what, when a kid and a parent comes to school, we all want to know what these recruiting visits are like. We go to the basketball game and we see all the recruits, and then we're like, well, where are they doing? I mean, where do they go? They go hide in a restaurant for the rest of the weekend. I mean, what would a typical experience be like for a kid that South Carolina is recruiting in their family? I think it depends on at what pro- what point in the process. I mean, if it's if it's an unofficial visit, if it's a kid that's, you know, a junior or uh, a, a incoming senior kind of thing, you know, you're always trying to check the boxes. You know, have they visited with academics? Have they met with our character development staff? Have they visited with the training staff? I mean, you try to find what's important to the kid, what's important to the family, and then you make sure that they meet with the people that will be involved in their day-to-day life from that component of, uh, of the organization. So if a kid, a kid may be uh, very interested in our business school, we got a fantastic business school, right? So when he comes on campus, I'm going to make sure he goes to the business school, gets a tour of the business school, and meets people over in the business school that he's going to see on a day-to-day basis that are going to help him and make him whatever he wants to become in his, after, in his, you know, in his life after uh, football. So... You know, every kid's different. I mean, they may have a true interest in strength and conditioning. You know, I mean, they they all have to strength and condition, but there's some kids that really love it, and there's some kids you're like, it's like pulling teeth to get them to do it, right? So if they really love it, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure my strength and conditioning staff knows that, and they're going to give the best presentation they've ever given in their life when that kid's on campus in front of he, he and his family because they know how important it is to it. It may be facilities, which, yeah, they all see facilities, but you're going to really spend time with a kid that, you know, facilities are super important to them, right? Um, football, football, the X's and O's. I don't, I, you know, my biggest frustration with some of this NIL stuff is we, as we get deeper and deeper into the weeds, I, you know, I, you really got to find the kids that love football. You don't want to, you don't want to recruit the kids that l- love what football can do for them. You want to recruit the kids that love football because if you took NIL away, you took facilities away, they do it on gravel. Roads, you know what I mean. They 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 play football in the middle of nowhere. They don't care. It's just about love of the game, and it's harder and harder to find some of those guys. So Taylor, you're in the building. I mean, I understand that. I, th- I think most of our viewers now and listeners understand the grind of the routine. I mean, you, it's it's fun and games for us. It's a job for you, and and you're competing every single day with with elite programs for elite players. And but but let, let's go to NIL for a second because I want I want our listeners and viewers to understand clearly. So, so I've always interpreted your role and responsibility. Tell me if I'm wrong. You're, you, you are a, an employee of the university. You're a member of the University of South Carolina football staff, but you're kind of a liaison with, with Garnet Trust. It was Carolina Rise and Garnet Trust. They had a merger. Now it's Garnet Trust. So Garnet Trust is the, the collective of choice at the University of South Carolina. I think we understand the day-to-day grind in the football building. What is the contact or communication you have with uh, with Jeremy and Mark at Garnet Trust? Well, first and foremost, I mean, I we we talk every day. I mean, I, I even if it's like last week was spring break, I still talk to those guys at some point. Whether it may be a quick text, just making sure nothing's going on, nothing's happening. Um, the the bulk of my job is just trying to help. You know, as you mentioned, like I'm in the facility, so Garnet Trust is not in the facility, and. And, and and so what I try to do is I just try to help our players and their families navigate from the collective and from the NIL side. So whether it be the recruiting process and like being kind of the person in the building, because they see me as many times they come to campus, they see me. If, if, if they're on campus, I'm going to see them at some point. So they're going to have that familiarity. They're going to have that comfortability. Um, I can talk about him now. I mean, Dylan Stewart, his mom was very worried about the, the NIL process and, and just who was going to be tugging at him from, from that standpoint. So just helping her get in front of the right people, making sure she's connected to the right people so that she has that same level of comfort 
with those with those as she does me. And that's the bulk of my I mean, our guys come to me for a variety of different reasons. I mean, it could you know, it's not just NIL. It's it's a speeding ticket. It's a parking ticket. It's a flat tire. It's hey, I needed it's life. Exactly. So you know, they come to me for a variety of different reasons. They also we've got. I know everybody in the state knows Clyde Wren. That's what he helps out a tremendous amount with all of that 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 as well. So he he's very involved with what's going on from that standpoint too. So they'll come to him. They'll come to me. So. That's kind of just kind of serve as that conduit and that and that familiar face, that person they can always come to, they can call, they can text, and then if they got an issue or they got something that they need to get taken care of, that's when I can reach out to the necessary people and try to help them out. Taylor, it seems to me that the velocity that Coach Beamer's implemented is, and and, and if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong, and you will. But 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 th- there are some programs out there that entice players with extravagant numbers on the front end. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. It seems to me that Coach Beamer's philosophy is make a commitment to us and we'll eventually make an even bigger commitment to you. In other words, let's reward players on the – not the back end, but in the process of playing football at South Carolina. It doesn't seem that the staff and Garnet Trust – or are in the business of basically buying a player to get him to commit, but rather commit because you want to be a Gamecock, and then we begin processing the advantages of Garnet Trust and and the staff as a whole. Is is that philosophical? One thousand percent. And he was coach has been very adamant about that philosophy since day one. And you know, I'll tell you this from a recruiting standpoint. Believe it or not, recruiting takes a back seat when it comes to NIL to our current roster. Because he firmly believes, as well as I do, and I think it's the 100% right approach, that we are going to take care of the ones that are in our building and taking care not only of us in terms of wins and losses, but are taking care of their business. They're doing the right things on the field. They're doing the right things off the field. So the ones that we try to take care and prioritize above anybody else are those young men in that locker room every day that are pouring their blood, guts, sweat, tears, all of it out for us on a day-to-day basis, right? So that's his number one goal. He's always been adamant about that, and it's always going to take a back seat to what we're trying to do from an NIL standpoint in recruiting. Now, from the recruiting standpoint, looking at it, you know, from incoming guys, our approach to NIL, NIL is going to be the last conversation we have with you. We're going to check the academic box. We're going to check the city of Columbia box. We're going to check the housing box. We're going to check the football, the X's and O's box. We're going to check the character box. We're going to check all the boxes. And you're going to fall in love with everything about us, everything about our program, everything about the city of Columbia. You're going to want, like you said, you're going to want to be a Gamecock. And then we can get into the conversation. It, it, it really is surprising at how few people – Two years ago, even thought to have the NIL conversation because they wanted to be a Gamecock. Then a few more wanted to have the conversation in year three. And then now it's more and more. But we're not, we don't turn it away. But at the end of the day, we're trying to develop that real relationship. Identify, evaluate, recruit, sign, communicate. All those pillars stand on one foundation, and that's relationships. And that's what our program is built on. We want to have the best relationships with our players because ultimately, That's what's going to keep them out of the portal, okay? There's going to be some you can't rationalize with, you can't talk to because they're going to go chase whatever. But there's reasons guys have re-entered our our, our program after having left and gone somewhere else, right? So we always try to build everything off relationships because that's what's going to keep your roster intact. But that's also what ultimately is going to win out in recruiting too. So so when does – is it fair to say, Taylor, that there's just – there's a lot of money in play? It's, it's unavoidable that we're not going to – it's a bit naive to say, hey, we're never going to discuss money. This is amateur athletics. I heard Nick Saban appear before Congress talking about, hey, man, I mean, I'm not saying it's the reason I got out, but but I'm kind of old at this. I've done it a certain way. It's worked. Now there's this new way of doing – I mean, are we – I mean, obviously we're in a growing pain era or a growing stage era. Um do, do you? I mean, I'm not saying do you have an opinion of where you think we should end up, but do you have an opinion of when you think we get where we have more clarity on what can cannot be done, what what your obligations are to the university, the connection with the, with the collective, what Mark and Jeremy can or cannot do? I mean, do you believe that we're making progress in creating a model that's more acceptable for the for the typical college football fan? I, I Isn't that kind of like, where we want to get? 
Yes. A place I, I where hope, fairness and equality seem to be I hope, winning the day. I hope that's what everybody's trying to do. Do I think that the things that have transpired over the last three, six months, as far as rules, regulations, policies, have really taken a significant step forward? Absolutely not. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I don't, I'm a fan of NIL. I do, but I do agree with what Coach Saban said with his remarks the other day. And, but I also think that there's a little bit of a happy medium between the two, if that makes sense as well. I mean, I'm not completely wanting to contradict myself or, you know, go against what Coach said, because I, I do think there was some validity there. However, I think that the NIL and the NIL space is good for college athletics. It's good for college athletes. It's good for their families. What I think really, and, and I actually do have an opinion, if you care to hear it, on where I hope or see sure, things I'd love going. To hear that. I mean, I mean, you live I, it. I read about I would, it and talk about it. You live it. At the end of the day, if, you know, a couple things, it could get, we could probably spend two days talking about this straight, but we need to get to a point to where it's a, you know, there's a, there's a salary cap, if you will. So everybody can only spend the same amount. And then I think the next thing that would make me a lot, make my life a lot easier is the, the transparency because, you know, I'm basing what I'm hearing that another school is saying from this kid and this kid could know how to play the game or this family member can know how to play the game. And, it may be a hundred thousand dollars more than what they're actually telling him. So I think just the the level of transparency that's out there would, you know, if it increased, that would help out a lot too, because that would that would help with the overspending by some people. And others are are willing to overspend, others aren't. So that would also create a little bit more level playing field, if that makes sense too. So I think getting to to where there's a set number that everybody can spend creating the transparency between each school so everybody knows what everybody's getting. And not that anybody's wanting to create a bunch of pocket watching and, and complaining, but it would just allow schools to better manage their own situation. It wouldn't be about what other schools are doing. It would really be about our, what we're doing and, and making sure that our guys are being treated fairly if they're in our locker room, but we're also competitive in a recruiting space too. And, and, and Taylor, my concern, and I've talked to Mark and Jeremy, Mark more, th more than Jeremy, my concern is that we adopt an in, kind of an NFL model and we, we, we let the market forces rule the day. And I, I still believe there has to be some hanging on to amateur athletics. I'm not saying the market is, a, is contrary to team, yep. but, but Aaron Rodgers gets $30 million and the wide receivers getting $6 million. They've accepted that as professionalism. That's the way the world works. I think that would ruin college football. I, I mean, I think if we ever got to a true NFL model, and I hear that a lot, I'm not saying that we don't adopt some of the NFL practicalities, but but I'm afraid that if we get to a day where Garnet Trust are paying a quarterback, you know, $5 million a year, and the left tackle's getting five grand a month, we lose that sense of amateur athletics. Maybe, maybe I'm a romantic at heart, but but I, I, I worry about I worry about a kid on a team making $10 million and the other kid on the team – who, who you probably consider as, as valuable and viable to its success, you know, get, getting a stop and a five. I mean, I'm not saying what the magic number um, needs to be. I, want, I do want you to speak to this. Um, whether we like it or not, it's here. I mean, the, the, the market forces have entered college football. We're, 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 we're changing in the most dramatic way we've ever changed the sport that I grew up loving and, 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 and wanted to be a part of. Explain to us why Garnet Trust is so important if the University of South Carolina is to remain and continue to be competitive in big boy SEC football? Huh. Well, I mean, they, they I call them the bank, and I mean, they're they are the bank. So if they don't, if the bank don't have any money, the bank ain't gonna, we're, we're in bad shape, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, 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 I tell people all the time, whether it's a family or a coach or somebody asking me about it all on the street, like. I don't want to have the most expensive team in college football. I, I really don't. And I, I don't think – I don't want to speak on behalf of anybody in our building, but I don't think that anybody thinks that way. <laughs> Maybe our players do, but I, I don't think that it's, it, it's really not that. I just – what we have to do at South Carolina is we have to be able to compete with anybody in our conference. If we can compete with anybody in our conference – and I'm talking on the field. I'm not talking monetarily. I'm talking on Saturdays. If we compete with anybody, it's going to make everything so much better. I, 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 I say it all the time. What Coach uh, Parrish and, and, and Coach Staley do and, and are doing in men and women's basketball right now is unbelievable. But 
I truly believe that you can, you know, and they 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 may or may not agree with this, but you know, football kind of is 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 can help everybody be successful, you know? And they're, they're, I know they help us. I mean, Coach Staley, and we take people over there all the time. We take people to see Coach Paris all the time and, and meet them. They want to be, they want to meet them because of the success that they're having. So, you know, football is, is key to probably, you know, most of all of athletics. And, and having success on Saturday is, is huge for the entire university and the athletic department. So with that being the case, you're – we're not. We can. We we we've got a great staff of coaches. We're only as good as those players. And if you don't have the, I've never. I I, I say this, this is one of my things. I've never seen. And y'all may have. Correct me if you have. But I've never seen a donkey win the Kentucky Derby. Okay. I've never seen a donkey win the Kentucky Derby. So it, it's about Jimmys and Joes, not the X's and O's. Okay, X's and O's can help the Jimmy and J- Jimmys and Joes be successful, but we've got to have great players. And in today's world, unfortunately, fortunately, however you want to look at it, in today's world, the Garnet Trust and the NIL component are catalysts in keeping our great players and bringing more great players to South Carolina. At the end of the day, that's just the reality of where we're at. So that's why they need the resources, i.e. money, to be able to do what they need to do from a collective standpoint for our student athletes. And that's not just football, that's any sport. I mean, I don't I don't know the specifics over men and women's basketball or tennis or wherever, but I would venture to say that there's student athletes that are contributing at a very high level for all of those sport teams that are being helped out by the Garnet Trust. And that's that's where all this stems from is we've got to have we've got to have the strongest infrastructure in the conference if we want to be the strongest football team in the conference. That's that's very well explained. La- last question, and I want to touch on this, and you be, I mean, you would know better than I, the transfer portal. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, I was we, wondering we, we, we talk about up. money. I mean, Charles Barkley famously said, "It ain't about the money; it's about how much money." I mean, in politics, I learned money's the answer. Now, what's the question? You've explained that. I mean, there's no doubt that money is a part of this. You hope it's not the central ingredient, but it is a part of it. it it's it's um it's a complementary to um, an ancillary to the recruiting process. It just is, whether you like it or not. But the transfer portal seems to me to be somewhat out of control. Um, as a college football fan that that believes the sport has to have some degree of loyalty and commitment, I'm not blaming the kid. I mean, I, I really, I mean, if I were an 18-year-old kid and I'm playing at School X and School Y gave me a better deal, <laughs> I, may, I mean, I'm just being loving. If I'm 19, 20 years old, hey, it is it would what hard. it is. I'd like to believe as I've gotten older, commitment – you know, means a little more than that. But but you care to expound upon the transfer portal and how complicated it has made everything. Well, yeah, I, and I will. And, I, and I'll tell you, I'll to kind of go back to a previous question you asked me too, and you maybe throw that mug at me here in a second because you, you sound like a college football purist. So, you know, the transfer portal, NIL, these mega conferences, those aren't necessarily college football purist love language right there, right? But I will say this. I think I'm, I'm a fan of the, the the larger conferences because if you've got 10 people around a table or you've got three people around a table and you're all trying, those three are trying to agree on the same thing that the 10, it's going to be a lot easier to get three people on the same page than 10 people on the same page. So I think with some of the restructuring and shaping of college football from that standpoint, it's going to it's going to eventually affect the NIL picture where everybody can come to terms and operate under the same guidelines and principles, right? Also, with the transfer portal, they've there's already conversations going on within our conference in, this, in the SEC. I know the Big Ten is having their own meetings, and those two conferences are talking back and forth. Um, they – it's it's gonna there's gonna be some reform on, on the NIL standpoint from the NIL standpoint and from the transfer portal standpoint. Um, I, I, I probably got way off on another. Jeremy, who there, needs but, to, no, you got my brain going a million miles an hour. I'm a purist who has accepted reality. Right. Um, wh- whether I like it or not, I'm the mayor of Realville, and I got to live in the world that that I live in. Um, when we make these reform decisions, who needs to be in the room? I mean, it doesn't need to be me. I, I would be, I'd be totally unobjective. I'd be as partisan and biased I as you wish, can imagine. I do wish head coach feedback had was, was heard a lot more because those are the, I mean, obviously the position coaches are dealing with it. I deal with it, but head coaches are thinking about it from our level, right? 
a conference commissioner, and no disrespect. I mean, we've got some great leaders a in our television in our business. network president. Do, do they really understand what is going on? Do they really understand? And I, I mean, I don't want to incriminate myself here, but that's always been my thing. Like with the NCAA, do they really know, like they're setting all these rules on what we can and can't do, whether it be a phone call or a text message or this or that? Do they really understand what we're dealing with? You know what I mean? It's like, obvious they don't. And sometimes this, and and I was just about to say, sometimes the decision or the rule or the guideline is like, <laughs> that doesn't help us. You know what I mean? That actually makes it worse. But as far as the transfer portal goes, I, I am a fan of it. I think we can benefit from it as a, as, a, as a program. I think because of the way Coach Beamer has handled our team and our culture and the things that he has put in place from day one and just the way that he treats not only the players, but every individual in the building, but specifically and especially our players and our team, we got kids that want to stay in this program. They're not looking to leave anywhere. And we can, it goes back to your previous question, as long as Garnet Trust has the resources and the means to make sure that if a kid does hear something from somebody else that we can adjust and fix, then we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine from the NIL standpoint at that point. We're going to be fine from the culture and people wanting to be here standpoint, right? So I believe in the trans. I think the transfer portal is uh, something that that's, can only benefit us. Okay, and some people may disagree because certain people have left to go here or certain people have left to go there. But I truly believe that it's something that can benefit us year in and year out because more people want to be a part of what we have than than not. So, but with that, I do wish that there were changes to. It. I wish it was only maybe one portal window. I wish they would. I know they're 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 working. They've they've changed you know signing day and they're going to adjust the portal window in in December, January and all that. So I think they're going to get to a point to where it's it's more, um, it makes more sense. Let's just put it that way. Um, but at the same time, I do like I, I do like the portal because I, I'm, I'm a part of an organization. I'm, I'm associated with the head coach that people want to be a part of more than they don't. So it, it can really, I, look, I view it as an opportunity to always benefit us instead of hurt us. Is it easier to evaluate a portal player than it is a high school player? Um, I wouldn't say easier. I, I, I think... Um, I, you know, it, it's it's no different than, and, and and I shouldn't say this very emphatically because I've never worked in an NFL organization, but I, I view it as the same as like NFL free agency and, and evaluating the pro personnel versus value, them evaluating the college personnel. I mean, we had our pro day yesterday. You know, they're, they're probably getting more, going from college to pro, they're getting more of a ready-made prospect than what we're getting out of high school. You're so getting a raw product. I think I think our evaluation process has to be a little bit more extensive maybe. I think our evaluation process is a little bit more tricky because you just don't ever know how a kid at 17, 18 year old, what he's going to look like at 21. Going from 21 to 23, I mean, it's not maybe not a whole lot of change. The, the biggest thing at their level, in my opinion, is kind of making sure those character boxes are intact because – you give a kid a ton of money. Now we have to build that component into it too, because if a guy gets a significant amount of money, is it going to make him lazy? Is it how's he going to react? Like, is he going to create problems away from the facility for him? You know, all those things have to factor into it. But I do think that um, evaluating college prospects, I find it to be uh, a little easier because you know I look at first of all, I, I look at it, I look at two things right out of the gate. I mean, what's his production? I mean, I don't care if he's coming from Texas, El Paso, or if he's coming from Middle Tennessee. I don't care where he's coming from. If he's not productive there, he ain't going to be productive for us. I, I truly believe that. Now, if he's productive there, then you got to say, okay, this guy's productive. Let's see how the skill set translates to our level of competition. And then you can really kind of get an idea of what kind of player you think that guy can be for you. Taylor, last question. Uh, Coach Beamer impresses me to be kind of a culture-oriented guy. I mean, it's not about this day or that day. It's about what sort of culture are we building over the long haul. I mean, I you know, I, t I tell my buddies with, with a little bit of Shane reminds me every day is the 4th of July. You know, does he have bad days? Is he ever angry or upset? Or I mean, I'm sure he is, but but he puts on a very public face of optimism and and let's a build a culture together. That doesn't happen overnight. What What, what do you tell fans who are – a bit frustrated that, that things don't go as fast as they hoped they would. Because I do believe, and, and I'm very bullish on Shane. I mean, I, I am. I, I believe with all my heart that for this era of college football, we couldn't do any better than the head coach we have. But 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 people are impatient. Yep. 
and we're asking people to spend more money, that creates more impatience. It's kind of an instant gratification, and a lot of people believe that because I spent more money, because I gave to Garnet Trust, damn it, I deserve results now. That's just not the way. It, when you build a program, culture and patience have to be a part of that. Why are you optimistic? Well, I'll say this, too. In 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 uh, defense of the fan base or whoever that may be frustrated, I I get it. I mean, you're you want to win them all now, absolutely. And but here's what I will say to that too: if you don't think I want to win all these damn things, you're crazy. You know what I mean? Like nobody nobody in our building. Like like I sometimes I, I get on social media and I'm like, do these people realize that like I know what happens if we don't win? You know what I mean? And and nobody in our building wants to roll in there on a Sunday after a loss like that, it sucks. It sucks. And, you know, reason for optimism, I, I, I go back to what you just said. I mean, I think that he, he has done it the right way from down from day one. And we do have such a great infrastructure and we have a great culture that at the end of the day, like that's going to be, you know, it's kind of like love wins. You know what I mean? Like everything, everything is going to be okay as long as he is at the the as long as he's driving the ship and doing the things that he's always done and the things that he's always going to continue to do then you know sometimes you're going to have to weather the storm right i mean you get on that boat and that captain's the best captain in the world and he treats everybody great and you got all the cargo supplies and everything's good but you may hit some rough waters i mean that's just part of it like i i tell people this all the time if if this were easy it's too much fun everybody would want to do it it's too much fun. Everybody would want to. There's a reason we don't have a problem filling williams Bryce Stadium on a Saturday. Everybody wants to be there. You know what I mean? That's the best days in the, uh, of the year. But, you know, you're going to hit rough waters. I mean, I, 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 I'm incredibly optimistic about our team. I mean, there's not one single program. I've been in the building in Alabama. I've been at Arkansas. I've been at Maryland. I've been at Sanford University. I've been at UAB. I've been in all these different places. There's not one program that I've been at personally. I think back to all those teams. There's not one program that could survive six season-ending injuries at the offensive line room. There's not. There's not. And it, it, I mean, it, look, you call it low, whatever. I mean, I truly believe that, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that go into it, a lot of factors that, that, that go into the success or the failures. But I truly believe if we stay healthy and, you know, it, we're going to tell a lot about ourselves in, in, in the next 15 spring practices over the next four weeks – I truly believe that we have a chance to have a, a, a great year. And a lot of it is because Coach Beamer is who he is, and he's always been who he is. And he's he's got foundations and principles and values, and it doesn't matter what day, it doesn't matter what amount of NIL, it doesn't matter what the situation is, he always goes back to the things that is, I'm sure his mother had a very strong influence in, but from a football standpoint, his dad believed in, and I look at the success, and the apple don't fall far from the tree. I mean, you know, I, there's no reason why we can't have a run like Virginia Tech did at the University of South Carolina. I truly believe that. And if I didn't, I, I've had opportunities over the last three or four years, I would have taken them or I wouldn't have come here. I mean, we weren't headed in the wrong direction when I left the University of Maryland. Co what Coach Locks and those boys have done, fantastic job. Three straight years, three straight bowl wins. So, you know, they're, do they're, headed, in the, you know, they're headed in the right direction too. I mean, I, I didn't have to leave. So... I say all that because I do believe in him as a person. And I think at the end of the day, it comes back to who you are as an individual when you're the head coach. And if you do things the right way, you know, it may not result in a win one day or it may, you know, not result in enough wins to keep you around. But, you know, I, I truly believe in him as a, as a person. I think he's made great staff adjustments and hires and everything that he's had to navigate this offseason. I'm excited to what you know. I get more excited these days about the spring because you bring in 15 new transfers. You got to you got to complete a different football team on your hands. And one thing I will say too, um, we've got 83 out of 85 scholarship players on our campus for spring football practice. We've got 114 guys on this roster today, and we only carry 120. So. The reason I think that's so important is we're going through spring ball with our fall football team, and, and for for you know for the most part, there's a few there's a few guys that will report in the summer that I'm insanely excited about, and I think they're going to contribute and contribute a lot early, but I'm very excited about having the core of our team. Now, 
you know, we need to make sure, you know, everybody needs to get healthy. We've had some guys that have gotten banged up and all that. I'm not going to get into all that because I don't want to be the spreader of news. But once we get everybody healthy and everybody's full speed, you're going to see what kind of team we have and be able to make some necessary maybe adjustments in that spring portal window, keep everybody locked in, and then I think we got a chance to have a special season. It'll be uh, September before we know it. I I don't want to pass time by or wish it by, but um, – you know, everybody loves the fall. There's no doubt about it, especially in the South and especially in the SEC. And, you know, it's uh, it, I, we're excited about it. I think, I think we're, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough slate. I mean, it's, it's hard. You got to go to Oklahoma. You got to go to Alabama. And then they took it easy on us by giving us LSU and Ole Miss at home, right? You know, all jokes aside. I mean, that's, that's a gauntlet. But um, I think we got the right guy leading us. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And, um, you know, I think we got a great group of kids in our locker room. I mean, the character – and the uh, you know that's something that, that, that I cre- I tip my hat to coach because he he vets all these guys before we ever ink paper uh, from a scholarship standpoint. And I'm gonna tell you right now, you know our, the character of this football team is at an all time high. Forget the talent level, forget you know whatever. I truly believe the character of our football team is higher than it has been since we walked in the door. And that's an testament to him. That's an testament to the coaches that he's put in position rooms to lead these young men and develop these young men and. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, if you got if you got the right character, the right DNA is what they call it. If you got the right DNA, then you know you may you may be able to win a fight against a bigger guy every now and then. So I'm excited about um, you know where 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 we're heading right now. Very well said. Thank Appreciate you, Taylor. It. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate you joining us. Absolutely. Thank you again to Mickey Fans for sponsoring the Garnet Trust podcasts.